everyone. Thank you for attending our webinar on TeamQ. This is a fun one to do. This is kind of a, an interesting piece of um, solutions technology that we, we talk about and, and a lot of people are surprised in terms of what it does. And I have to say almost all the customers we present it to come back with uh, comments on, oh, I could use that in this area. That's very, very different. Oh, I need to bring that other group in to look at this. So we're happy with our, our public response to this. So if you look at you know what we've been doing in terms of um, call control, we've certainly been in this market a long, long time um, from 1982. Um, while we do messaging, that's a key piece of what we do as well, but we've also done call processing. Um, back with a very simple automated attendance up through uh, the much more feature-rich speech interface that we have today, and then the full find me, follow me type of functionality we offer with personal assistant. And through all that, um, we have talked to, you know, hundreds and hundreds of customers in terms of their call management needs. So if you look at us as a company, um, we've been very good over the last few years in realizing um, one size does not fit all. Within an organization, there are different people who work different ways who have different needs in terms of messaging and call management. And the call management piece has actually not gotten much play in the past. You know, you'd think if you, if you kind of do a quick mental inventory, if you go back uh, 15 years, you had probably a business phone number. It might have been a DID or it might have just been a main number and calls got transferred to you. And then mobile phones came along and then most people had two business phone numbers. Um, but today, if you look at the number of devices you have that are communication enabled, and whether that's a Skype client on your iPad or um, you have link clients that are telephony enabled, um, people have many phone numbers. And they're not all good all day long. And call management is something that people are just now realizing isn't as efficient as it should be. But what individuals need, what teams need, and what businesses need are all different. They all work differently because of the way they're set up. So we have, we have webinars that talk about the business side. We have webinars that talk about individuals. This webinar today, we're going to talk about call management needs for teams. And as we do that, um, we need to always keep in mind, you know, what's out in the market. You know, who buys our solutions and why? A lot of our business today still comes from replacement of um, legacy voicemail systems. People that are trying to extend the life of their existing infrastructure, maybe they haven't decided exactly what they're going to do in terms of voice over IP for communications. And there's still many of them trying to decide whether they're going to keep it in-house or look at cloud or, or look at a hybrid cloud. And all of that makes these solutions more complex, and the acquisition of these solutions, pretty difficult. You know, it's not a simple look at a product, decide it'll do what you want, and move ahead. So what we've been doing is making sure our product fits into the categories, you know, where we, where we operate in such a way that it doesn't limit you. So today, if you put our system in, you do not have to worry about what you do with your telephony infrastructure. Um, if you have legacy today and are going to voice over IP tomorrow, we handle that no problem. Same with your groupware. Same of all the things we connect to. Um, we are the kind of the last of the large private players. Um, our goal is to fit into every type of market and every type of environment. And in that arena, we recently relaunched a product that we'd had a few years ago um, in an area that um, people probably haven't identified, but they recognize the problem when we describe it. And you'll find our, you know, our TeamQ logo is, is pretty consistent, but that little tagline underneath, it changes a bit depending on who you're talking to because there's no recognizable name for this kind of solution. And so we're going to talk about what this solution does. And the easiest way to look at this solution is sort of look at the niche that it fills. And um, this is call distribution. This is how do we distribute calls to groups of people with specific needs. Now, if you look at the general um, kind of pieces of application software out there, certainly most PBXs have hunt groups, and that's the very simplest way to distribute calls. You put 15 people in a hunt group, 10 people in a hunt group, and you go ahead, send a call there, and then you have linear and circular and all those options. Uh, while Link doesn't have hunt groups, it does have response groups that sort of does that same thing, has a few challenges there, but you know that, that's, that's where you start. As things get more complex and larger, um, people that have 100 people um, sitting in a room where they're taking the same type of calls, they'll tend to go with some specific contact center software. So you're going to put an ACD system, multimedia contact center in, 
You know, this is the manager trimming 15 seconds off of a call. This is the reader boards on the wall. This is the many, many people doing the same process over and over again. There's a lot of technology and software out there for that. So simple hunt groups, one end, um, complex ACD on the other. But there's this hole in the middle. And the hole in the middle tends to be kind of informal work groups. They're not like contact centers. They aren't all doing the exact same thing. They aren't working the same way. But the basic hunt group doesn't cover it for them either. And that's where we've targeted Team Q. So Team Q fits a very specific category of work group. And I think the easiest way for us to talk about these um, is the difference between knowledge workers and task workers or process workers. Task workers, this is... Um, 25 support agents in a room, um, they take the next available call, they're on their screen, they talk to the customer when they're done, maybe they go into wrap up for 20 seconds or a minute, then they take the next call. They do calls, that's what they do. And it's pretty much the same call over and over. Within those centers, there's a little bit of skills-based routing capabilities, you know, just kind of handle specific calls in one way. But this is a um, served for dinner methodology where literally you push the work down to them and they take calls. That's what they do. On the other side, knowledge workers are different. They do take calls. Um, that might even be their prime function is to, is to uh, do a process that involves talking um, with, with callers who are calling in and looking for something. The difference is how they do it. Um, and this is, not, this is not somebody who takes call one, then call two, then call three. The interaction is different. The um, types of things they do besides calls are different. It's an unstructured process. In other words, think of an IT help desk. An IT help desk takes its first call, it talks to somebody. It might get off that call and take the next call, but more likely it takes, you know, that person kind of steps away from the phones and goes and does the research or maybe even goes out and connects to the, you know, the person's machine for troubleshooting. Um, they go through that, fill out a ticket, and maybe they're, maybe they're then back going to take another call. But it's very unstructured, and it has personal workflow. And the, these people are not just taking call after call after call. Now, when you try and deploy these kind of groups, and here's a list of the kind of people that we've looked at, um, it's difficult to get this to work with either just a hunt group or with a traditional call center. Now, if, that, if this group of people, all they do is sit at the phone and do the same thing over and over and over again, call center is going to be fine. But for the traditional corporate IT help desk, as example, or tech support, the fact that they, they take a call and then they have other work they have to accomplish means an ACDQ just really won't do it. Um, and they're very, ACDQs are very expensive, and that license for that agent to not really take advantage of that because certainly the numbers and the stats for these kind of groups um, are all over the place because they're not just repetitively doing the same process. Um, ACDQs are, are a not a good solution for most of them. On the other end, a hunt desk isn't really very good. If you have a, you know, a hunt group coming in, six lines in a hunt, and a bunch of people are watching them, and you know, they all have slightly different skill sets. You know, within those, these kind of groups we're looking at, they aren't all experts in the same thing. And unfortunately, there's no such thing as a skills-based hunt group. So hunt groups deliver all the calls up, and people kind of manually juggle them. ACDQs are call after call after call. Team Q is meant to sit in between those two types of groups. We call it an informal call center, an informal work group management. Um, we have, a, like I say, a lot of names for it. Um, and, and you can have multiple cues because, you know, you could have within an organization. Um, in fact, quite typically, anyone who looks at our product comes up with two or three different kinds of cues um, that they see, see this would help for. Um, but it's small. And you're going to see why it's small as we look at kind of the screen aspect of it in a few minutes. But this is for up to 25 agents in a team. Then you can have up to 50 teams on it. If you look at the features list, yes, we can do push model call distribution, ACD. You can set team queue up where all the agents log in and the longest idle agent gets the next call. That's not really what it's for, though. The, the one below that, the pull model call distribution, is where team queue shines. What we're going to do is let the agents, with a screen and information we're going to give them, control those calls themselves. Take the calls that are relevant to them, move away, do something else, come back and, and take a call. Even though that's very unstructured, there's a full supervisor package with logs and reports and screens and all of the rest of that. The end result is for these work groups is a very cost-effective way. This costs much, much less than an ACD-type solution. 
but it also gives the information to this kind of team that they need to decide what the appropriate call is for them to take. Years ago, we had the tagline, what's more important, the incoming call or the work you're currently doing? And of course, back then, if you had a telephone, it didn't matter. You had to answer the telephone, and you quite often answer that phone thinking, oh, well, I wish I hadn't because that other thing I'm working on is more important. What we now do is give these agents the kind of information they need to make those decisions. So let's go through a scenario and look at the caller experience to get an idea how we're going to do this. So we're going to start, you know, we have a num number, it's going to come into CX. Uh, this is, by the way, TeamQ is an additional application module that runs on the CXE system. It's not a separate server. You don't have to buy, you know, anything extra for it. There might be port implications we'll look at, but this is basically just like all of our other solutions. You buy it, and the license turns it on, and now you're sharing all the resources on the system. So a call comes in. Very first thing we do is capture that caller's number. A lot of reasons for that. Capturing A&I is no, no big magic trick, but we're definitely going to do that. And then we play some sort of announcement to the caller. Welcome to the IT support desk, something along those lines. But the real strength of TeamQ comes from the fact that the tools on the CX platform include a lot of technology for interfacing with callers. So we're going to be able to gather information from those callers up front. And it might be what's your account number, what's your employee number, and your software serial number, basically anything we want. And then besides simply give me a number, we can use menus. So we can have one or two menus that offer the caller choices in terms of what they're looking for for support. So we actually can ask for two different numeric pieces of information and play two different menus. Most systems won't use all of that, but it is possible. So now we play a menu. In this case, it's a tech support desk. We'll say, so what operating system are you on? One for uh, Windows, two for Linux. And now we know a lot about this caller. Before we've even done anything in terms of a decision-making process, we have their account number because they entered it, which means we can go find out lots of interesting things about them. We know what they want. They're looking for Linux support. And we have a callback number if we need it or if we need to do a lookup from that callback number. So this metadata is the key to the strength of TeamQ. This isn't just answer a call, hold it, and give it to the next agent. This is find out what this caller wants, who they are, and then let the agents determine the best way to process that call. And the metadata piece is extremely powerful. Things like if they entered their account number, when the time comes to present the call to an agent, we can enable that agent to get a screen pop. So in this case, we're saying take that account number, do a data dip into salesforce.com, and pop up a screen when they're ready. And that from that number, we also can, from that same database, pull back things like the caller's name, their warranty status, what kind of contract they have. So with just a little bit of custom programming, you now have more metadata that shows on that screen for better call management. And all of that is going to be available to the agent. Now, once we've answered that call and we've kind of figured out who they are and what they want, we now have sort of the traditional tools in place. Now, these are a little different, though. We certainly can say your position in queue is two, the estimated wait time is four minutes. But that might not really be valid in a poll model. If you think about it, um, the way this is going to be handled, depending on what you're looking for, you know, how your call gets handled will be affected. So quite typically, we won't use those announcements. It's going to depend on, on kind of how homogenous the queue is in terms of times. But the thing we certainly could do is offer them choices. You, you know, we've given you an indication of how long it is until you're going to get it answered. Would you like to hold? Press 1. And we will hold that call. And while they're holding, they're on a port on CX. And that's one of the things we have to talk to people about is, you know, that depending on the size of the queue, how many calls do you think you'll have holding? Because that can impact, you know, that can create a need to add more ports on the CX system. You don't want to hold, you want to leave a message, press 2. We'll put them in a special mailbox that can be monitored by the agents. Or if you'd like to request a callback, press 3. And then a callback appears on the screen just like a call does. The difference is when an agent finally gets presented or takes that call, um, they make a manual callback and connect so that that user can not be tied up holding that call and the port's not tied up on CX as well. So now that caller gives us all the information. They decide to stay in queue. And bang, now they're the third caller in queue. This caller in queue is simply a matter of who came in first. If you're using push model call distribution, well, it's very important because that, that's the last caller to get answered there, of course.
but we're not really using push model, we're using pull model. And with pull model, we have this group of agents that are monitoring the screen that shows all the calls that are on hold, and they all have different skill sets. Um, in this case, I'm showing there's only really one Linux specialist. Now, it could be the Windows specialist could also take Linux calls. They're just not as good at it. So if agents are now looking at this screen, the um, agent number one, since they are a Linux specialist, will always take the Linux call. Even though that's the third call, even that's the old or the newest call in the queue, they can take that call. And that's very important because this is this kind of the skills-based routing aspect of making the decision on who can best handle that call. Now, if I'm on a call for Linux already and I see another call come in for Linux, I can also reserve that call. I can hit that call and hit hold, and that caller is now waiting for me. When I'm done with my current call, I can get to that call. Or if I look at that um, the information, the metadata, and I see it's John calling back. A few minutes ago, I told John, you know, reset your system and call me back. And now he's calling back. I can hit that call and hold it as well. So the callers of, or the agent's ability to manage which call it takes is the real strength of the system. So now I'm over here and I've handled this call um, number three, um, caller number three. I'm managing that call. Now those other two agents, they can take a look at the calls in the queue. And probably the first one, you know, the first agent that's free would take, the, you know, the call they could, you know, they could handle that was the oldest. There's actually a button, you know, to get the, the oldest call first that they can use. The pull method is, is the key to most of the productivity gains you're going to have in this. Now, we talk about this kind of um, queue with a bunch of people and different skill sets. There's other areas where this comes in really handy. Imagine a dispatcher, a single employee dispatcher at a shipping company, and the truck drivers have to call in after you know they've delivered a load and before they move on to the next site, they call in in case they're being rerouted, etc. And they hold for this dispatcher for a few minutes who says, no, okay, yeah, you're, you're okay to go. Go on to your next one. Well, this dispatcher could basically run this app, and the, when the truckers called in and put their number in, she could see who was holding, and she could see, well, that person who just called in, I have nothing new for. She could hit a best, um, button, send them straight to voicemail. They can leave their message there. Whereas the next one is being rerouted, she could click on that and take the call. So the who's calling and why aspect fits into a lot of call management scenarios. We're not used to thinking about that. We all do this with email all the time, right? We look at email, and based on who it is, that determines on how quickly we get to the messages. Um, and we do a little bit with calls. You know, some of you recognize your uh, significant other's cell phone number as A and I that displays on the phone and things like that. But this is really taking it to the next level. The ability to gather metadata lets you make decisions based on that data to help you effectively manage incoming calls. So when a call is complete, now this agent might click release, and maybe they're set to go into wrap up for 60 seconds if you want that, or maybe they now get up and they walk over to a machine somewhere, or they walk over to a cubicle, they now they might have a different part of the job. Remember, these aren't necessarily call after call after call type of jobs. So maybe this agent goes and does some research. He walks away from his queue. And now he has some choices on how he does that. Um, in this typical environment, there would be um, a, a call status. You'd probably create maybe something called research. So when he's done with the actual call and he hangs up on the call, he clicks status research and he goes and does what he's supposed to do, and now that status research can be tied to this same event, and when you start doing reports, it gives you a lot of information about the productivity of the employees. So that agent experience um, is, is just key to how effectively it's gonna work. Now, if we look at the basic functionality, once a call is in the queue, the agent has a queue screen. This is a queue screen, and you can see I have various calls here. And if we kind of just go through the calls, uh, the one on top, there's an agent on. Tom is already on that call. The next one down, there's an agent on. And you can see one of them selected the category of other. One of them selected Windows 7 support. Now, the third call down is a network call. And you notice it says on hold for Tom. Well, Tom is already on a call. He evidently saw Bill call back in and reserved that call. Maybe Bill had called him a little earlier in the day. And now there's two network calls waiting and basically... Um, that's what's available, or excuse me, there's a network call waiting and a Windows 7 call, so an agent would know what to do. Now, the calls that are on hold and the calls that are waiting are doing so on a CX port. So I'm now tying up three ports on my CX system, basically, that, are, that have calls that are waiting for something to do. The rest of those calls 
no, those aren't on ports. Basically, those have been transferred out, um, and, and we're still tracking them, but the whole key here is we're not taking up any of the CX uh, resources to do that. Besides this screen, of course, supervisors have lots of management tools. This is a supervisor screen where they can look at not just the agents on calls, but they can look at all their agents and what their status is, this very typical kind of agent piece. And then we have three really interesting logs that the supervisor can use. These are kind of real-time snapshots they can get from their client. And this is the call log. It's showing you every call that's coming to queue uh, recently, how long it was, and, and how it was reserved. And you could export this out to an Excel spreadsheet, but we have reports, actually, that will do that for you. There's an agent log, same thing. shows you every in and out of status. So if you wanted to find out how long an agent's been on break, you could just run this really quickly. And then the queue log, which is very interesting, it shows you call history. So you can actually really quickly look at a call, and the call ID 1106, you can see it, it started at a specific time. Um, we gathered input from the caller. They were queued, and um, then basically it got transferred, and then it got ended. So um, the, these three are, are just kind of real-time logs available from the supervisor management tool. Of course, like any call processing system, we also have a full-time reports package, and this report package has, I think, 13 reports in it, and they're what you'd expect, the, the type of reports you'd expect, and the manager can be set up to run those. And basically, um, they have all the things you'd look at, agents and teams and calls, and they have not only detail information, but down at the bottom of every report, they have this kind of summary information. We have a, a document on reports that we can send you that talk about kind of what the reports do and how they'd be used. So from a looking like a regular ACD system, we're pretty strong. We have those things. But there are still things we do that are unique, and that's really kind of where we like to focus the attention when we're looking for opportunities for this product. One of the great things about this product is its architecture, and it's great for a number of reasons. Um, like I said, it runs on the CXE system. So if CXE can hook to your phone system, then TeamQ is going to work and CXE can hook to every phone system. So you certainly could have a newer system. You could have Link. You could have a newer Avaya system or an older blue Avaya system or a Cisco system. You can also have an old Strata DK uh, key system, um, anything out there, basically. You know, we, we've maintained integrations with all the legacy phone systems as well as the new phone systems. And there's no special connection. There's no CTI link here. If you think of how this works, we're just using those same lines to connect to the PBX that we're using for voicemail, automated attendant, find me, follow me. There's no unique piece here. And that does two things. One, it lets you know that you can put it on your environment today. And if you have an environment with multi-types of phone system, you can support that today. And you also know if you look at moving later to a different, like maybe you're looking at moving um, up to Broadsoft in the cloud next year, know that the connection can just be repurposed and it'll work in that environment as well. And from an environment perspective, it's very simple. Someone calls in. And, you know, ex external call, internal call, it really doesn't matter. And that comes in through the phone system, goes into the CX system. We run that script type thing that we just saw, and now those calls are holding and ready to go. When an agent wants to take a call, they hit the take call button, and CX transfers that call to the agent. So architecturally, it couldn't be more simple. And that also has a pretty interesting impact on price because we don't really need any special hardware at all. Now, in terms of handling a call, if I go through another script call here real quickly, because um, it'll, it'll show the screen at the end, a call comes in for an agent. Now, an agent can be um, sitting on your network in your office, or with a VPN connection, they can be running from home. When the agent logs in, they put their credentials in, and they put in the phone number at which they wish to receive calls, which means I could work all morning here at my desk and sign in with my desk phone. I could actually go and, and sit in Starbucks and read technical documents for a couple of hours and have it come to my soft phone on my iPad, uh, and then I could go home and work from home and have the calls come to my mobile phone, as long as I have a VPN connection of some type. So typical kind of script, welcome to the help desk. Tell, tell me your employee number. Tell me what kind of support you want. Here's the current status of the queue. What would you like to do? You want to hold, leave a message, or leave a callback request? In this case, they say, Hell, hold, and now we have this. Now, the way this works, as an agent, as soon as I click on that screen on, an, on a call that's waiting, that take call button will become active, 
and I click take call, and CX transfers me the call, and then that changes and it shows me on that call. Now, what's interesting at that point is we don't really have a way to know when the agent is through. We didn't want to implement this with expensive CTI software required on the phone system, which not only increases the cost, but it also makes it very specific in what environment it can work. No, the way we do this is when you take a call, that next call button up there actually changes to hang up. When the agent is done with the call, they click hang up, and that's how we terminate the record on the call. So this is very different. You know, if you're very, very worried about accurately timing every second for your agents and you're not sure your agents would play fair, this might not be the solution for you. But agents click hang up, that record ends, their screen refreshes, and they're ready to move on to their next task, which might be another call or, as we said, might maybe be a research project. So also, as a, an agent, I can highlight a call and hit the hold button because that's somebody maybe I talked to before. So I can hit that hold button, and now that call's holding for me. I could redirect that call to another queue or another phone. Or maybe I'm the manager, and I look down there and say, you know, my SLAs are in trouble. Um, I'm going to send that caller um, to voicemail to leave a message, and then we'll get back to them. So you can click um, message, and that caller will be transferred in to leave a message. And that mailbox typically is one that's monitored by agents in the queue. Now, one of the things that makes this also very inexpensive is how we can do screen pop. We're going to allow an agent to do screen pop. This is also a pull model screen pop. In other words, when you answer a call, we don't automatically pop a screen. To do that, there's, there's CTI software required on the phone system side. There's very complex software monitoring the application you want to pop. The way we do it is if that client application on that user's desktop has a way that we can pop a screen. So if they have a web services uh, interface or a COM API or storage procedure call, then it's very easy for us to go ahead and simply enable one of the numeric fields. In this case, I did the identification field. So what that means is when I, when I go to take that call, it's actually going to let me um, right-click on the identification field. There will be a screen pop button. I hit pop and it's going to send the ID we captured with that call into that software and pop it up at the user's phone. So it's a manual type screen pop. And that makes it so much easier um, in terms of uh, fitting into any kind of environment at all. And in this case, we, you know, we actually um, we use Salesforce ourselves, and we have built a couple of links for customers where we can pop up the, the relevant screen. So this is very much a pull model app both from getting the call and then opening up the screen pop if that's what you want. Now, the key to this application is, of course, finding the kind of group that uses it. You know, if you have a, a room with 100 agents um, doing um, order status or something like that, and they're all doing the same thing, and you're thinking, well, you know, maybe we could, you know, that's an older system. I don't want to upgrade the software. Maybe we could switch to this. Those, those are discussions we need to be very careful with. This is not really meant to be a traditional ACDQ product. It has most of the features. I think you've seen most of them there. And the reason we have these discussions a lot is because this product doesn't cost very much. Assuming you have a CX system or you're buying a CX system for your maybe legacy voicemail replacement, and you have our UC Connect license, which is our advanced um, applications module license, and you would have that for a number of other things perhaps, or if not, you could buy it for this. But once you have that CX system and UC Connect, for $50, you get an agent. For $250, you get a supervisor license. Now, these are one-time software charges. Granted, it increases the ongoing software maintenance cost slightly, but very little. But compare that to the cost of deploying a hardware-based ACD system with a server and a CTI link and all of that, and we are just way down on the cost scale, which is great because what we're really focusing on are these little teams that got bypassed when ACD was deployed. You know, the tech support desk, somebody said, well, I could use ACD, and they said, really, $1,500 a year for a license? I, you know, I don't think we're going to do that. Those little groups are, are really the ones that we're targeting here. Now, if somebody inputs some numeric data, let's say uh, uh, an employee number, an account number, we can show that account number on screen, and, you know, somebody could look it up, I guess, but it's much easier if we go out and do a data dip. A data dip just means... You know, I have that number. You have a database. 
I can put that number in and pull back out relevant data. So I could put in, um, I, I might ask for your um, contract number or your software serial number. I could put that into some database and pull back the version of software you have, what kind of contract you have, all of that information. Data dips are actually very easy to do. And on our price list, we also have a data dip. If you want us to build the software, as long as that software can be reached using, again, um, a web service, uh, a COM API, and any traditional programming technology, we will actually, as part of the installation of the system, um, do that data dip for you. They're, they're pretty easy, and uh, most of our systems have been deployed with them. So if you look at these costs, you kind of come to the, the, the screen that um, gets a lot of people excited. If you have these work groups and they do need some kind of call management system, if you compare rolling out TeamQ with a formal call center, you can kind of see, and, and this is a, an extract of the white paper you're going to get that talks about this, but you can kind of see where we fall on that scale and why a lot of people get very excited. And we just we need to make sure that um, customers understand how we would deploy this and what it does. Um, and I have to say, for almost every customer I've presented to, um, they've had at least two or three groups. You know, I might be presenting to the IT department, and they will say, oh, yeah, we could use this for us, no doubt. And you know what? You know, so-and-so, this group over here, they, they had issues with incoming calls, too. They were trying to get on the ACD system, and it was too expensive. And a discussion usually ensues that ends up two or three groups that we're talking to. And because of the cost, it's very easy to roll out, very economical to roll out for multiple groups. So if we look at call management in general, it's something we've been doing forever. I mean, it's where we started. I mean, first, the first, I guess, call function we did was voicemail, but we immediately went to automated attendance, speech automated attendance, incoming fax routing. All of that is a key piece of our product. And the way our product works is it's one single application. You open up different pieces by buying licenses, but you never put a specific feature server in. There's no speech server. There's no mobile client server. There's no team queue server. You may end up putting multiple servers in for scalability, redundancy, consolidating down multiple sites, but you never need one just for features, which means it's less expensive to put in. And from a maintenance point of view, CX has one maintenance tool. So there's not six or seven maintenance tools your people have to learn. From a user point of view, there's only one web client and one mobile client where everything gets done. So the users pick this up very quickly. So many of the systems, particularly the suites, of applications we compete with, by the time you roll out the kind of functionality we have, users have three or four admin clients they have to learn, and the, and the, and the speech rec automated attendant doesn't know anything about the voicemail, and the mobile client is separate. And, uh, it makes for a very confusing kind of deployment. And what we're happy to do is give you customers who've rolled all this out, and, and you can talk to them about how easy it was to roll out and how easy it is to maintain. Again, whatever your environment, we're very happy going in and talking with you, and um, we support basically whatever you, you know, whatever you have today, and as far as we know, whatever you might be looking at going in the future, whether it's on-site or it's in the cloud, um, whatever you're going to do, you can rest comfortably that we can actually be in that environment. And if there are any, now we're ready for some questions. There are a few questions, and if you have the um, the panel minimized, use the orange arrow in the upper corner to expand that, and you'll find the question box. Um, Neil, first question: Can the agent put more than one caller in their queue? So the queue is actually the screen, and it will show all the calls that are for that queue. But I, it, what they might be asking is, can they put more than one call on hold? Uh, yes, they can. So the way this works is uh, I'm an agent, I'm on a team, and I build a queue, and that team is assigned there. But as an agent, I can be in, on multiple teams. So when I open my, my client up, I might be looking at everything for tech support. And also, because I'm also on the customer service team, mixed in with that, I see all the customer service calls, and I can tell them apart. Sitting next to me is someone who's just in technical support, when they open up the client, they only see the tech support. So we have the ability to mix those calls. Okay. Uh, next question. So did you say that customers might need to add more ports if they buy TeamQ? Yeah. If you think about 
you know, the, one of the first discussions we have is, you know, well, how many calls were, are you likely to have on hold? In other words, when we turn this on and people call in and they put their metadata in and now if you're going to have them wait, that whole time they're waiting to get transferred to an agent, they're tying up a port. So if you have a queue that's very well manned and, you know, you don't expect, you know, few people to hold and they only hold for 20 seconds, it might not require ports. But if you have a more complex one where your call times, you know, can be 20 minutes and you expect to have calls holding for five or 10 minutes and maybe you're going to have a half a dozen of those or a dozen, that definitely means you need the ports on the CX system to do that. And we, we can sit down and have those kind of discussions and kind of talk you through the process of figuring that piece out. Okay, thanks, Neil. Another question, what other call centers do you compete with? That's an interesting question. Um, it depends on what the other person's looking at because we do tend to have people say, well, how do you stack up against, and then they'll name a popular call center. But that's, that's, it's not really that kind of competition for us generally. I don't know of anyone that does what we do. If you're looking at a poll model um, kind of call center with metadata as, as the controlling factor, I don't know anyone else who does that. I'm not saying they're not out there, but we've never had a customer come to us and say, oh, yeah, we're looking at one of those. If, if you're talking about, you know, actually they want to use us as just an ACD, then I, su I suppose we, they, we kind of compete with all the smaller in-skin ACD systems. But once again, I'm always very careful when I have a discussion with customers that want to use this as a pure ACD system. It works fine, but it's just a little different, you know, it's a little different way of doing business. If you think about the, fa the fact Agents have to hit the hang-up button to close the record on the system. It's, if you're trying to replace uh, an existing call center with this, there's a, there's a functionality change there that we need to make sure um, you would understand. Okay, next question. Are the resources for announcements and messaging accounted for when deploying TeamQ as opposed to just the standard CX platform for messaging? So... I'm not quite sure what they're trying to get at there. If you have a CX system and you and you enable TeamQ, the only additional resources besides the ports, which we've talked about, are, are the, the the messages, the cues, you know, the recordings and pieces like that. And and they're a tiny piece in terms of storage or anything along those lines. If if that person is looking for something different, um, we could maybe find out offline what it is they're actually trying to figure out. Okay, certainly. And we do, we do follow up on all these questions generally, even if we think that they were answered on the webinar. So for those of you who have asked questions, um, hopefully you'll, you'll hear from someone. Uh, next question. Does this work equally with Macs and Windows systems for the screen pop? No. We only have a Windows client. It's not about screen pop. It's about you have to have Windows to use our client. And uh, undoubtedly, some people will send us bad emails saying, why don't you support Mac? And it's because the business world just doesn't use Mac enough. There's just not enough density out there to justify. It's not like you, you port a Windows application. You have to have a complete development group. And over the years, for all of our products, we have just not seen enough need for Mac for us to build those versions. Okay, another question. How difficult is the programming side for the scripting and processing calls? <laughs> I had, a, yeah, I had a uh, teacher early on when I was taking uh, C-sharp classes, and he was a, a gentleman whose command of the English language wasn't all that great, but he was very bright, and he started the class on the very first day by saying, programming in C is easy once you know it. And that's the same with this. It's very obvious when you look at it uh, after you've been in the screens two or three times what you're doing. But we do offer an assist as part of the pricing to put in that first queue, that first team, that first application, and the first number of agents. And, you know, that's part of the install we do. When we walk away, you have a fully functioning system, and that means you have examples. So if you want to build that next queue yourself, you open up the queue we did and go through it, and from that point of view, then I think it would be fairly easy to do. Okay, great. Another question, are there any tools for monitoring agent calls like Silent Monitor? No, we don't do anything with the audio. We don't record the audio, and we don't do silent monitor. You would have to do that through the phone system side. And, and also one thing that, that maybe it's in another question is we don't currently have an active reader board for the wall. That being said, one of our distributors in Europe has uh, just finished a product. They're getting ready to put it out on the market that is a reader board for TeamQ. 
Okay. Neil, it looks like that wraps up the questions, unless anyone's still typing. So certainly um, for the audience, if you think of questions after we conclude and you'd like to submit them, you can always email us at info at avst.com. Just one more time, we did record. We'll send that out when it's available. And I will also follow up with an email later today with the slides, as well as the evaluating the ROI of informal call centers white paper as a thanks for attending. And um, just want to thank everyone for taking the time to join us. We'll look forward to seeing you on a future webinar. And um, I'll go ahead and let Neil give his closing words as well. Thank you, Anne. And mine are pretty much the same. We really appreciate when you come to these webinars. This one in particular with call management, um, we find opens up a lot of discussions with customers as they think about not just the, the teams, but, you know, you're right, I have five devices that I need to receive phone calls on, and how am I really doing that, and am I being effective? So if you have any discussions you'd like to have about call management, once again, we've been doing it for uh, over 30 years. We'd love to have those discussions. So thank you for attending. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. To learn more about AVST, please visit www.avst.com.